Hello and welcome to the Sonic Cinema Podcast. My name is Brian Scuttle and thank you for joining me at www.sonic-cinema.com. Today I am going to uh, pay tribute to one of my very favorite movies and one of the best films I have ever seen uh, with a friend of mine, Marv Dickey, as we look back on Alex Price's Dark City. It's been a favorite of mine. It was a movie I anticipated uh, considerably when it came out uh, based on my appreciation of The Crow by Proyas. And it is 20 years old this year, and I thought it would be a good idea to uh, discuss it and uh, to take a look at um, some of the things that I probably haven't had a chance to talk about in my reviews of the past and uh, to give appreciation to some of the things that I really like about it. So thank you very much for uh, listening, and uh, please welcome Marv Dickey as we talk about Dark City. Thank you very much for joining me, and uh, today I'm pleased to be joined once again by uh, my good friend Marv Dickey as we uh, discuss Alex Preuss's, um Dark City, which turns uh, 20 years old today. Marv, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for having me again, Brian. Dark City was a movie that I anticipated quite a bit when it came out. I had fallen head over heels with Alex Price's uh, previous film, The Crow, a few years ago and uh, a few years before. And uh, when I first caught wind of the fact that he had another one coming down the uh, pipeline. It was a movie that I basically tried to read as much about it as possible in uh, sci-fi magazines and uh, online and stuff like that. And when I saw the trailer for it on uh, Alien Resurrection, the previous Thanksgiving, um, I was actually very excited about it, and it just got my anticipation for the movie even more uh, up there. So when the movie came out, I I knew exactly when the movie was coming out, and I knew exactly that I was going to go see it that day, uh, opening day. I was at college at the time, and uh, I'd already planned out where I was going to go see it and what gotten I had gotten a uh, newspaper that day uh, to uh, get the showtime, so I knew exactly where it was going, and then I and so basically I. <sighs> I did my uh, morning classes that day, and then I went home, went back to the dorms, and got in my car and proceeded to go to the theater I'd uh, planned on going to see it in, and I was just blown away. Uh, it was a movie that lived up to my expectations. It was a movie that excited me and uh, thrilled me, and it was a movie, and it's a movie that remains one of my very favorite movies of all time, as well as one of the best films I've ever seen. That, and one of the reasons that I, one of the reasons I got so excited about it even more was the fact that Roger Ebert was very enthusiastic about the movie. He gave it four stars. He ended up putting it on his, the, at the top of his 10 best list that year. Um, as well as uh, adding it to his great movies uh, category about seven years later, and he also recorded audio commentary for the DVD, which was one of the uh, which was one of the first DVDs that I bought when I did get into DVD a couple of years ago, and it was because of that Roger Ebert uh, commentary. The movie uh, continues to exert a hold on me, and it is a movie that, even now watching it for this podcast, I really find myself endlessly fascinated about. Uh, Marv, before we before we uh, discuss uh, some of some things more specifically, uh, what what exactly how how did you come to uh, watch Dark Save for the first time? Well, my experience was very opposite of yours. <laughs> my, uh, I back then I didn't really I paid attention to directors, but I didn't really like follow any of them. I mean, if I, I knew who Spielberg was, I knew who, all the way down like Kevin Smith and Richard Linklater, but I never followed their careers, uh, so, like you did uh, with Alex Pro. How do you pronounce his last name? 
uh, Alex uh, Proyas. Proyas. Proyas? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I never get that right. <laughs> um, and, but at the time, I hadn't even, I, I wasn't even aware of the film coming out. Uh, it was, it was in a rough time in my life, um, uh, personally with my family and everything. So, uh, I had, I wasn't, I was unaware of the movie coming out. And then my buddy, Mark, uh, he just one day said, look, I, I want to go to the movies and I don't want to go alone. Are you coming? And I said, yeah, let's do it. What we seeing? He said, dark city. And I had no idea what I was getting into. I, I I didn't know what it was. I hadn't seen a trailer or anything. So we we go to the theaters and and my mind was blown. I really I really really enjoyed it. I wound up seeing it. I wound up saw I saw it twice in the theaters and then when it came out on VHS, I, I I picked up the VHS and I I watched it probably five or six times in the first like month or two. It it, it I just really I really really loved it. Yeah, that, w- that was that was the same thing with me when a movie would come out in VHS, and I would I I think I ended up seeing it four times in theaters, um, and then yeah, when it came out in VHS, I bought it and I watched it uh, constantly. Um, yeah, and one of the things that I love about the movie. Um, and one of the things that really struck me, especially watching it this last time for the, uh, for the episode, was the fact that it, it touches on so many different genres. It's not just about science fiction. It's not just about film noir. It's also got horror elements. It's got uh, detective story elements. It's got thriller. It, it, has, a little, it has action, of course. It has a little bit of everything, and that's one of the uh, and and one of the great things about the uh, screenplay that Proyas wrote with uh, Lem Dobbs and uh, David S. Goyer is that it's able to balance all of those elements and do so effectively, while also ultimately keeping its eye on the uh, primary ideas of the uh, of the universe of Dark City. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm. I'm still here. Okay. All right. I was. I was. I wasn't sure if you were. If you were. No. No. Sorry. No. You're. You're. You're all right. You're all right. Um. You're. You're speaking so eloquently, and I, I feel like <laughs> I, I got lost in your words, Brian. <laughs> well, I, I. I definitely appreciate that. Um, sure. <laughs> now, have have you seen? Have Have you watched the director's cut of Dark City? I, I have not. Okay. I, I have I, I have not watched it. Okay. Um about yeah, it was about eleven years ago, eleven, twelve years ago or so, uh New Line released a director's cut of Dark City and fundamentally it's it's fundamentally the same film. Uh there are little beats and stuff like that. Not there are a couple of longer scenes that are stretched out um but it's a lot of little character beats and a lot of different uh different takes and stuff like that that are uh that are added in by uh <clears throat> by Proyas cuz he he was uh one of the things but the big difference between the uh theatrical as well as the from the director's cut is the director's cut uh excises the narration by Kiefer Sutherland at the beginning of the film, which was studio imposed on uh, Preuss, and Preuss was famously not uh, not a fan of because of the fact that he because of the fact that it gives away the mystery. It it gives you it gives away a lot of the mystery of the movie. I never had yeah. that big of a problem with it, um, and it's weird watching the movie without it. It still works. It still works extremely well, but um, it's it's just very it it's kind of disarming to uh, just jump right into the uh, film without that narration, especially if you've watched it uh, a lot of times over the years. And um, but the fact of the matter is, it is it does definitely the the lack of narration serves its purpose. Uh, you. 
you basically are learning as John Murdoch goes. And I think that's one of the big things about taking out the narration is the fact that it puts you more in depth with the uh, character of John Murdoch, which is Rufus Sewell's character. Right, and, and I understand that the um, Price, uh, he he felt it was it dumbed down the film mm-hmm. with the narration. Yeah. And, and, and that's basically why the studios... Uh, According to some behind the scenes videos that, that I I recently watched to kind of catch up on it, um, that he he felt it was it was the dumbing down of the movie, and that's pretty much exactly what the executives, the studio executives wanted, because mm-hmm. it was it's one of those movies that you really do have to pay attention. Yeah. To, to if you're going to consume the movie, if you're just going to watch it and watch it, you're, you're probably just going to be like, eh, it's okay. Mm-hmm. But it's it's got so many different levels to it. That, <clears throat> You pay attention, you, you you start catching on to things and understanding a little bit more. And uh, it's a thinker. Yeah. And, you know, and John and Jane Q. Public, in the studio's eyes, are morons. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they're not wrong. Because <laughs> <laughs> look at, you know, like summer blockbuster popcorn films, you know, those those make tons of money because it's, they're, you know, sometimes people just want to go see a movie that they don't want to have to think about, and and this one's a thinker. Yeah. And it's and it's, and it's beautiful, and it's a masterpiece in that in that mm-hmm. in that regard. I I like being challenged. I you know so sounds like Breakfast Cut would be more up my alley. Uh, yeah, and it's been just just watching the theatrical release. Yeah, and it's definitely it's definitely worth checking out. It's available on Blu-ray, and it's got the director's cut as well as the theatrical cut on there. So, I mean, you can go back and forth, and if for some reason the director's cut isn't your cup of tea, or if you uh, think that you'll prefer the uh, director's cut over the theatrical. Um, I mean, uh, but yeah, the, uh, the lack of narration... I'm so, I, I, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I, I also uh, saw that uh, the, the director's cut also fleshes out the Inspector uh, uh, Inspector Bumstead, the William Hart's character. Yes, um, fleshes his character out a little bit better too. Yeah, and that's and that's one of the things that's really uh, that's one of the things that's really nice about uh, the director's cut. And it's it's not a director's cut in the same way of like the Lord of the Rings movies or. Uh, what we normally think about directors, because it's very, it it's really a lot of very subtle uh, changes in the story. Some of which are, some of which, uh, and it, a lot of it is character based. A lot of it is just fleshing out characters, and you kind of wonder why those changes were made in the first place because of the fact that I mean, it the movie doesn't lose anything by putting those in there; it only gains. And yeah, Bumstead is one of them. Uh, the uh, prostitute uh, by played by Melissa George that uh, Murdoch uh, meets at the lo- at the uh, food mat, and the uh, there's a little bit more added to that story and uh, that character, and you and it really adds a lot of. Um, it really kind of does add a uh, wrinkle to that element because one of the things in the director's cut is that you find out that that, uh, that prostitute actually has a daughter who was underneath the bed when the strangers were at that room. And oh, for real? So, and so, yeah, and that's one of the things that's added in the director's because that you see um, that they the cop... Bumstead and the cops find the uh, find the daughter, and she actually and she actually IDs the strangers, and it's it's one of those interesting little uh, twists that you never really will have thought about when it comes to the uh, movie, just in its uh, theatrical version. I mean, all of that's in the director's cut. It. it it's it's something that adds a little bit more of the mystery and it it's interesting to see what happens with uh that arc as well and it's it's just something that adds more to uh more to the detective uh story side of the movie and it's really uh interesting that 
that sounds phenomenal. I'm I'm sold on the directions, but I gotta go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been missing out. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the one of the things that I uh, one of the thing th- the film is very much uh, you know there have been other films. Blade Runner is obviously the uh, most famous one. I think as far as a combination of science fiction and film noir elements, uh, this is a movie that really takes the film noir to another level, where it actually. It, if you really think about it, it feels more like a uh, film noir uh, story with aliens in it and a sci-fi uh, bent on it. It's not just a science fiction movie told as a film noir. It's both of those elements, both the science fiction and the film noir, are treated honestly and really uh, taken to a very uh, natural place in terms of the storytelling in this screenplay by uh, Preuss, Dobbs, and Goyer. And one of the things that I kind of was fascinated by is when you really think about the world of that uh, the strangers create in, uh, in this city, is that nothing from it is modern. All of it is from that era of 40s 40s detective stories and so you it it sort of makes you wonder if if this movie had been even longer and if Price had felt the need to expand on this world further whether um whether you would find out that like these characters were this takes place in the 40s. It just happens to be a futuristic science fiction film because everything about it is basically very 40s film noir. Yeah, my, my theory behind that is that when the uh, these uh, energy aliens, so to speak, yeah. uh, when, they, when the strangers took the humans from Earth, I, my theory is they did it say in 1947 yeah you know or you know because it doesn't <laughs> it feels very like post-war mm-hmm. like it has a post-war feeling to it like uh this you, you know you know the atmosphere that that is portrayed in films of the, in the 40s it's a, yeah there's a very focused on mm-hmm. world war ii yeah it doesn't feel like that's it anymore so it, it does really feel like late 40s maybe even early 50s but mm-hmm. it, it, it that's my theory is when they when they took their experimental humans it was it was in that time frame so that's what they replicated yeah for their city yeah and it's it it's interesting it one of the one of the things that occurred to me during this one and I wrote it down was and it 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 just it just kind of hit me for the first time even though I mean I consciously thought about it. I think Roger Ebert talked about it in one of her one of his reviews and maybe his podcast or in the commentary and stuff like that. It's like, and like you, like you said in your theory, I mean, it, it's, it's more that these, these humans were taken and they were taken for this experiment. They're basically like mice in a lab for the strangers. They're not like this. Cause I mean, it's just one city and it's like, they're just these humans that they're going uh, back and forth with on memories and changing their memories, changing their lives to try to get to the idea of what makes us human and what causes us to live the way we live. And, uh, you know, it, it does make you wonder, and this goes into your therapy as to where did the rest of humanity go and where these, whether these people were just taken. And I, and hearing your theory makes me believe that yes, they were just taken, um, and this is just sort of a lab off of Earth that they take that they uh, took these humans to to study them, and that add that brings a whole another sort bunch of questions together that would be really interesting to see uh, fleshed out somewhere. I I don't necessarily want a sequel to Dark City, but it's it's something to where there are some definitely some openings to uh, further develop this world, 
And I know I had read the novelization at the time because, like I said, I was fascinated by the movie. I was fascinated by the... I wanted to read as much as I could about it, and the novelization was one of the things that I read about, but it's been it's been two decades since I've read it, so I don't really remember a whole lot about it. Right. I I always... I, I think Rufus Sewell, who plays John Murdoch, he does a really good job of... Somebody who basically, at first, he's just sort of going through the motions of what you would expect this protagonist to do. And then as he goes through those progressions, as he goes through the story, he starts to become more and more human. And I think that's one of the really interesting things about what Proyas and his screenwriters do in this movie is that basically you're starting out with archetypes Rufus Sewell, you know, Man on the Run in the Hitchcock tradition, Jennifer Connelly, Torch Singer, you know, wife, Bumstead, uh, detective, and then Kiefer Sutherland is the scientist who knows everything. And th- the more each scene, you start to see more and more about these characters, and they become, and as the story progresses, you do see them become more human. You do see them become uh, where their humanity comes from. And it's, it's, it's because of the actions that they create as opposed to the memories that they have been implanted by. And that's one of the... And Jennifer Connelly, as much as I, I've always loved Jennifer Connelly as an actress, um, there are times where I... Starting out, it's... it's kind of rough going for her as an actor as a uh in terms of this performer this performance as emma it's like there are times where she's a little too stilted but by the end of by the time that uh her and murdoch are have a scene together where uh she's visiting him in prison and they have this big breakthrough where jennifer Connolly says it's like i can't fake how I'm in love with you. You know, that's not something that's because that's just been planted in me. I just have that feeling. And uh that's in by the time that she gets to that moment, it's like her and it's because of the fact that her performance, she's more human, she's more fleshed out, she's a truly in-depth character at that point. And we we've seen this arc, and it's one of the it's it's an inspired choice by Proyas to be able to uh, create this arc where it's like you start out with archetypes, you think they're going to continue on as archetypes, and then they just build and build the character just by little pieces, little little nuances, little touches in individual scenes that gets us to sympathize with them. I, I absolutely agree. I love that because they really are just it seems like they just picked a, a bunch of characters from film, the classic film noir, the detective, the, the, like you said, the man on the run, mm-hmm. the, the, the lounge singer, the prostitute, you know, they, they pick those, but then they, you know, for the most, for the most part, they, they all evolve. And yeah. that's pretty much what I feel a lot of this, this film is about is evolution mm-hmm. uh, with the, the strangers, their experiments, um, you know, with the humans is to basically try to find out like what it would, you know, what makes them human, yeah. what keeps them being human, even though they keep changing their identities and their, their places in the world. Like, uh, like, uh, for instance, when they changed the, the poor couple that, that were yeah. arguing at the dinner table yeah. and they made them wealthy, mm-hmm. you know, they're, you know, obviously they're, they're, they're studying on them. And, and I feel that, that, uh, and Mur- like you said, Murdoch was becoming more human. And to be human is we we evolve, we adapt. Yeah. You know, and he's evolved to this, and he's adapting to this world, and, and to the point that he's even evolving into into like one of the one of the strangers. Mm-hmm. He's he's gaining he's gaining power such as the strangers, like the the, the ability to tune. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's getting the psychokinetic. Is that what it is? Yeah, it's term? yeah. I mean, the whole. Psych- 
yeah, and, and we can we can talk about it. like the idea of tuning the and yeah, it is it is very much. I mean, just based on the way that Proyas, uh, the way that Proyas uh, shows in the film, yeah, I mean, it is basically a psychic uh, phenomenon where it it's basically psychokinetic kinetic power. That's basically what it is. It's you know, tuning is just the way. Uh, Proyas uses it to is the term that Proyas uses to uh, the way the strangers are using this psychokinetic power to uh, or telekinetic power. Sorry, telekinetic. Um, this telekinetic power to basically alter the reality around them, and that's one of the things that and that's what makes John unique. Obviously, is that we we come to figure out uh, pretty early on that he has this power too and uh Schreiber the Kiefer Sutherland character is going to use that to his advantage to uh to free humanity from this enslavement that the strangers have them in but yeah it's basically a telekinetic power it's you know i mean if you want to go in comic book terms it's kind of like Jean Jean Grey and Professor X and the X-Men uh, it, it, I mean, that's basically what it is, and I mean, it's just Proyas' spin on it, and it's actually a really ingenious spin. It's the the tuning uh, effect um, from from the uh, from from uh, Murdoch's head. It, it's it's very subtle. It's not it's not over the top. It it yeah, it can look a, a little goofy, but it's it's just really effectively well done, and it's. It makes sense because that's that's what that power you would probably think would look like if you were to visualize it. Uh, it, it kind of reminds rewatching it. His uh, his tuning abilities kind of remind me a little bit of Harry Potter. Yeah, uh, where like it, it also it kind of starts with us with the uh, the auto man, mm -hmm. where the guy basically like tosses his wallet into into a chamber he needs to pay for it. He needs to pay to open it up. Yeah, so he uh, you know he's just slightly breaks it <laughs> mm -hmm. just a tiny little <laughs> thing and then and, and then by the, the climax of the film it's it's like holy cow yeah well and yeah it, it 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 goes to what you were saying about evolution and it's like yes that is one of the key things about the movie is that it's about evolving it's about humanity evolving and it's about these characters evolving into uh human beings that cannot be controlled and that's one of the and that's ultimately one of the themes of uh Proyce's work, and uh, go ahead. Can we take a second and and uh, just mention the giant glaring metaphor <laughs> when uh, I believe it was when Emma visits uh, Doctor Schreiber? Yeah. Uh, the the maze that's in the middle of the room. Yes. That looks exactly like Dark City with the with the rats <laughs> in it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is like this metaphor. Yeah, we get it. It's right in our face. All right. Cool. Oh, I mean, well, <laughs> well, and that's one of the things that Ebert talks about in his commentary about it, is that you you have spirals all over the place in in yeah. uh, Dark City. And, I mean, you you have the Vivinacci spiral. You have all sorts of spirals. And yes, I mean the the yeah. I mean, Proyas is not being subtle in that uh, in that scene. I mean, it's. Like, oh yeah, we're we're gonna be like rats in a maze to the strangers. That's basically what it is. I mean, there's no no reason to be subtle about it because of the fact that, I mean, you know, yeah, it's one thing to you know have people have to f figure it out, but at the same time, I feel like there's so much else going on in there thematically and emotionally speaking that there's some there's there's room for. Proyas to just lay it on really thick with a simple thing like, oh hey, look look at this mouse in a maze when uh, <laughs> Emma is a uh, is visiting Doctor Schreiber. Yeah, he, it was. I just wanted to mention that. <laughs> yeah. Every time I watch it, I'm like, I'm just like, I roll my eyes. I'm like, yeah, all right. Yeah, we're mice in a maze. We, we yeah. <laughs> And one one of the things that one of the central ideas in the film is uh, whether humanity is whether there's more to being a human and flesh and blood human in terms of uh, 
what makes up the human soul is whether there's something more to it or whether it's just the uh the collection of our memories and memory obviously plays a uh, huge role in the film because one of the things that the strangers do, do to experiment on uh these humans that they have Ooh. is that they mix and match memories and they're not necessarily uh the memories specific of these people, they're just random, uh, generalized memories of trauma, of emotion, of love, of um, childhood, of adulthood, and just very uh, specific things, general things that will become specific uh, key pieces of who, who these people are. And I love the way that uh, I love the way that Preuss visualizes this, um, and it starts off with our first flashes of uh, Shell Beach, uh, very early on in the film, and it's just this very uh, it's this very uh, <clears throat> quick um, cut to an image and the the uh, filters and the way that he he and his cinematographer Darius Wolski uh visualize it on uh on camera is just really really interesting to me it's not necessarily what we typically think of in terms of uh memory in film but it it f serves the same purpose and it, it just has an originality of vision to it that i I really uh, came to appreciate this time around. Yeah, when I rewatched this um, a couple of weeks ago, I fully like there was there was things about it that just like it popped to me that I I don't know if I even realized it in the past because it had it has honestly been at least fifteen years since I watched this film. Oh wow! Probably probably because I consumed it. Like, yeah. So much, and like I had, I had, a, I had the DVD copy back in like 2002, 2003. Mm -hmm. But you know, I only watched it like once or twice, if that. And um, it, it got lost along the way somewhere, so I had to run out and grab another one. Like, like you know, like I had to buy a new copy just yeah. to get a refresh course on on it. And you know, I kind of fell in love with, I kind of fell in love with the movie again. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it just. Um, uh, there's there's so many things about it that like I, I was noticing levels that I'm not even sure if I can recognize before I just don't remember recognizing. It's, yeah, well, and that's it was that's a good ride. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I've definitely noticed when I've sat down and watched movies for these podcasts and when I'm taking notes and stuff like that. It's like it really does sharpen your focus in terms, and you start to see things that even if you've seen a movie half a dozen times a dozen times or something like that you are seeing things very differently if you're looking at very specifically with the purpose of okay what am i noticing in this movie what are things that are standing out about this movie and yeah i mean dark city is one where yeah i mean there there are things in this 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 last viewing earlier this week that i am kind of I'm noticing it a little bit more. I mean, I may have noticed it before, but it's something that I am have a bitter I have a better um appreciation for and just just more of witnessing it for the first time in a way that I never really expected to before. And uh yeah, it's 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 a movie that's rich with that, and that's one of the things that Roger Ebert always talked about, and that's one of the things that he always loved about it. And uh, he talked about it in his commentaries, he talked about it in his uh, reviews for it, that it's just absolutely... One of the things that he pointed out, I think it was in the director's cut, uh, or in the uh, Great Movies review, was that Preuss is very generous when it comes to what he shows us, um, and he basically films the, he basically, he basically puts little things in the entire frame of the film that we, that when we come back to it, we'll catch every once in a while. And that's definitely been the case with me. Yeah, this, this movie, uh, the, the, 
the schemes and or the the sets and the, it's just it's amazing. It's a, it's a place you know me and my love of horror. Yeah. Um, it's it's sparked here with uh, with the strangers. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously they they the strangers appear. Their, their visual appearance is kind of Nosferatu meets Pinhead from Hellraiser. Yeah. And yeah. I, I absolutely love I love Pinhead, the character Pinhead. Mm-hmm. Not so much the movies he's involved in. That's, <laughs> that's, another, that's another show for another time. Right. Uh, but, but I love the character Pinhead, and I absolutely enjoyed Nosferatu, and I, and I love the image uh, of Nosferatu, and that, that's what they pulled off. Yeah. But um, this the city is so beautiful, like, to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, it just it just it calls me. I want to live there. Like when he goes visits his <laughs> uncle for the yeah. slideshow or the, yeah. or the little video mm-hmm. show, I want to like explore that room. I want to oh, I want yeah. to see what the rest of the house, rest of the house looks like. I want you know even every little apartment building. I want to like man. I want to just sit here and take it all in. I just don't 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 move this scene too much, man. Like I want to what's over that corner? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just it just it's just this is one of those movies that you wish you were you could just step into. Mm-hmm. Where's that uh, at Universal Studios? They got the Harry Potter experience. Where's the Dark City experience? Yeah. <laughs> no, and that that's <laughs> absolutely true. And I, it it the fact that so much of this was done on sets, and even some of the tuning was done on sets and movable movable buildings and stuff like that, just absolutely blows my mind. That this movie costs, I think, like twenty something million dollars. In 1996, 97, 98, whenever it was made. I mean, it was filmed in Australia, so I mean, I'm sure you've got tax credits and stuff like that that play a part in that. But the fact that this, this was a place they built, it's not just it's it's not just CGI green screened. Like, yeah, there's visual effects in there, but it's all at the service of this place that Preuss built with Patrick Titopoulos as production designer. And it's just, ab- and like you said, it's absolutely beautiful. I would love to, it, it would be great to have been on the set and just see just how intricate the sets were and just to experience this film on a much deeper level, on a much more elemental level than you're used to in so many blockbusters where it's, I mean, even the prequels that came out, even Fan Menace that came out a year later, it's like, it's so obvious that so much of it was m- built digitally. It's like, it's boring. That's, it's so lifeless. This is, this is a city that's full of life. And yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that it just adds to this sense that you want to see these characters succeed in what they're doing. You want to see Schreiber and uh, Murdoch be able to work together and bring down the strangers. But at the same time, the strangers are... It, it's hard to... Yeah, I mean, there's there's the visual references to Nosferatu, to Pinhead. Um, but at the same time, if you think about their central purpose, they're trying to live as well because their species that's dying and they're trying to figure out how to continue to live they're the same boat that they've put the humans in this movie in and that's one of the things that's interesting about the movie is the fact that it's like yes they're the bad guys in terms of good guys here bad guys here who are we rooting for but the strangers are the strangers are scientists they're stranger they're scientists in the same way schreiber is and they're and the way that they're handling the way that they're going about their business is definitely not they it definitely makes them the antagonist but at the same time even though they're arguably some of the most terrifying villains in genre history i think from a visual standpoint certainly it's they're in the you it's hard not to compare them to like Frankenstein, you know, and and Franken's you know, Dr. Frankenstein doing his experiments in Mary Shelley's world or Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I mean, there's that level of there's a certain degree of empathy I think you can have for the strangers, even though 
they're what they're doing is fundamentally wrong. And that's that's another level Proyas's storytelling that is just so brilliant. Right. You feel do you, I do feel a little uh, empathy towards them for they're they're struggling to survive mm-hmm. and they don't they don't they just don't understand how we I, maybe that's what they're looking for how to evolve yeah how to adapt yeah and I mean I I think that is exactly what they're looking for and I mean well and I mean even they say it like Schreiber says it like Mister Mister Hand says it played by Richard O'Brien who did uh, Rocky oh, Horror Picture the, Show. The, the, yeah, the great, um, really great Richard O'Brien. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, just a side note, like, I, the last time I saw Dark City before a couple weeks ago was before I had ever watched Rocky Horror Picture Show. I I saw uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show for the first time in 2005. <laughs> so when I rewatched this, I was all like, we're half. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I knew, I, I will admit, I still have not seen Rocky Horror myself. It's on my list. Oh. Uh, your, your list of shame? Yes. It's it's my very <laughs> long list of shame of movies that I still have not seen. Um, and yeah, but I, I do know who Richard O'Brien is. I, I do know, you know, his part in Rocky Horror, certainly, uh, in terms of the history of it. So, I mean, I, I'm sure that's a big part of the reason why uh, Preuss was so interested in uh, casting him. But yeah, I mean, it it's even, even like... Uh, even that's an interesting character because of the fact that it's like he starts looking at things, he's looking thing at things purely from a scientific standpoint, from his own specific standpoint of, well, this is this is what we've imbued these this character with, so this must be true. And even he and it's he's a great foil for Murdoch because of the fact that it's like in the same way that he is, Murdoch is evolving into more, somebody that's more human, Mr. Hand is doing that too, but in a different direction because of the f- memories that they've implanted uh, him with. Right. And uh, it hurts, God, there's so much. And and one of the reasons I I almost always bring up the Matrix with uh, Dark City, and oh you got it, and it's hard not to because of the fact that and there's a superficial level because of the fact that both the Matrix and Dark City use some of the same sets in Australia, right. but also the Matrix when it came out a year later, like. The Matrix was this bomb, this cultural phenomenon that just landed, and people were like, "Oh, look at what the Wachowskis have done with this." I mean, they've done spirituality and sci-fi and all of this, and they've blended action and visual effects and all of this into something that we had never seen before. And I'm like, uh, "I saw it last year." Now, Grant, the way Place yeah. and the Wachowskis do it is very different. But I feel like there's more to there. I've always felt like Dark City is the better film than The Matrix, and I think part of it is because of the fact that The Matrix, at a certain point, just becomes an action movie. It just becomes an action movie, and you start and you really start to see that with the sequels too. Um, the but Dark City, while there is action in it, it's always rooted in the story. It's always rooted in this larger theme where the action doesn't supersede it. And I think that's one of the things that the Matrix, that's one of the things that I haven't really, I, I like the Matrix now more than I did when I first saw it, but that doesn't mean I like it a whole lot compared to the way I like Dark City. My, uh, when, I, when I saw the Matrix, it took me three times to see the full thing. <laughs> it was in theaters. I watched it three times because I fell asleep the first time. Yeah. And at the part, mind you, the part where Morpheus is explaining to Neo what the Matrix is. <laughs> so I, when, I, when I woke up, I was like, what is going on? I'm yeah. lost. So I was like, I, I was like, the next day, I was like, I had a, bunch, a few buddies that wanted to go see it. So mm-hmm. I was like, all right, uh, I'm going to go with you because I missed it. I think I missed a few things. And I fell asleep again at the same part. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was like a, it was like a movie in, in itself. And then yeah. as the comedy rule, rule of threes go, I finally, for the third time the following week, 
I, I got to see that, that part I kept missing. <laughs> so it was, uh, it, I was like, when I, I was like, oh, the Matrix is like Dark City. And everybody's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, watch it when we get home. I'll, I'll show you. I was like, there's a little bit of comparison to it. And in my notes, I have, you know, like, I actually took a little time to, uh, to write up that, you know, like both films are about uh, uh, what is reality. You know, the, the, the character arcs of uh, Neo and Murdoch, they kind of, they're a little bit parallel. Yeah. You know, they, because Neo starts out as, as a nobody, he's trying to figure out why is he a somebody, and he, mm-hmm. and he eventually, uh, you know, grasps a hold of the powers and, and does what he does. Right. Uh, Agent, Agent Smith and the Strangers, you know, they're, they're both pursuing mm-hmm. uh, Neo and Murdoch, and you know they have the power, and uh, you know it's it's a false world they live in. You yeah, know, Matrix versus Dark City, it, mm-hmm. it's both false. But but yeah, here I have in my notes I say they, that they they differ because the Matrix is an action film um, that's you know story that has a little bit of story that to drive it. But, yeah. Uh, Dark City is the reverse. Mm-hmm. It has action to help drive the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And they I, go ahead and it's, it's almost like there's they're in the same universe, uh, the way mm-hmm. they, you know, the kind of like history repeating itself, so to speak. But you yeah, know, then you can <laughs> try to decide who's for, who came first, the you know, Neo or or Murdoch. Right. Yeah, and I mean it. Yeah, and I mean they both deal with a common theme. I mean, it's about it's it's essentially about virtual reality, except for the fact that. Dark City is, you know, takes place in an actual world as opposed to, you know, we find out that the in the Matrix that the uh, denizens have all been basically programmed into a computer by machines. And it's basically, they both are basically the same idea of humanity as a study for human inhuman captors who are trying, except one, the strangers... I, you know, and it's weird because it sort of goes back to what ultimately is this purpose that the strangers are trying to do. I mean, well, yes, they're trying to figure out what makes them human so they can so they can continue to live. But what are, you know, and we know from the Matrix that, well, the machines are imprisoning humanity because of the way that humanity treated the machines and we we know that that's it so the the purposes are different and uh it's and but i feel like the strangers is it's just so much more interesting and like you said it's matrix is fundamentally an action movie with science fiction ideas interspersed with it and dark city is the reverse there's action interspersed but it's ultimately at the service of ideas and it's and it's that it's that comparison that is always it's that reason that dark city has always engaged me more than uh the matrix has and uh yeah it's it's i mean and also it just goes back to the fact that i mean dark city is it's such a beautiful movie to watch. It's there's nothing true. While yes, it borrows from movies like Brazil and the Tim Burton Batman and Blade Runner. Of course, it does, and Metropolis and Fritz Lang's M and all of those movies. It's ultimately a an original world all its own, and that's one of the things that's so incredible to me. And the fact that Proyas pulls it off and you have this, and you have this maze, and it's like, I want to know the, I want to know the science behind, you know, the the maze that the strangers put humanity, these humans on, because it's like it's basically just hovering in space, and it's absolutely amazing. It it's just so striking and such an, it's that was one of those visuals, even. That was one of those visuals that just blew me away when I saw it. It's like, oh my god, I did not see that coming. That was basically oh, just going to be this floating in space. Yeah, it's it's just one floating like ship. Yeah, almost. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess it really was a ship because you know underneath yeah. <laughs> was was propelling it through space. 
uh, while we're talking about the visuals, the what really kind of surprised me after all this time is how well the CGI holds up. Yes, the, for, yes, for the does. most part, there's a couple parts that, that, like when they break open the uh, the wall at Shell Beach. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's a little bit it's a little bit off. It's a little mm-hmm. sci-fi channel or it's a movie type, but it uh it still amazingly holds up. And I think that has a lot to do with the the, the color palette that that they chose mm-hmm. artistically. Yeah. Um, and the it helps hide the uh, the faults of CGI at the time. You know, the the what makes CGI not hold up usually, like you said, like Phantom Menace. You know, like if you go back and watch Phantom Menace, there's so much that sticks out to me. Like, all right, that, that's yeah. CGI. That's CGI. <laughs> but but this, it's like it's like you know, like is that is that a miniature set? Is that, mm-hmm. is that, did they do that for real? It's like oh, that's that's amazing. It still looks good, like when the the city is morphing, when the city is changing. It's it's just it looks phenomenal. Yeah, and that was a and that was a movie that it it. It's it's interesting to consider. It's interesting that people consider it a cult, that's basically considered a cult classic. Even though the fact that I don't really know anybody who dislikes it who's seen it, like pretty much everybody I know who's seen it has liked it and even loved it. And the fact of the matter is, it's like it it is a movie that endured. It is a movie that found its audience. And a big part of that was probably Roger Ebert's support of it. I mean, he he put it as the best movie of 1998 over Saving Private Ryan, no less. Uh, right. I don't know if I entirely believe uh, agree with that, but the fact of the matter is, they are the two. They they were for me then, and they are now the two best films from that year. And uh, Dark City deserved yeah. more of a reputation than it did at the time. It does deserve the I feel like it deserved the success that the Matrix had a year later. I feel like it deserved the uh it it deserved awards for production design and uh cinematography and visual effects. And yeah, the visual effects do hold up now. I mean, yeah, it's it's and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that so much of it was practical as opposed to CGI. Right. They did not rely on CGI the way that other filmmakers would have. And that is one of the things that is brilliant about that film, and that's one of the reasons it is one of the great science fiction films of all time, not just of the past 20 years, but ever. Because it hits... It doesn't just hit the same uh, universal themes of humanity and... Uh, traditional uh, science fiction ideas, but it it does in its own way. It's comp- it's completely comparable to Fritz Lang's Metropolis, but not in enslaved to it. It's it's inspired by so many of these other films, but it stands on its own because of the way that Proyas and his collaborators uh, put it together. And the fact that he was able to make this movie for the budget they did and the way he did it just makes it all the better. And it just really, there's very little about this that doesn't hold up. It does hold up now. And it's just such a sprawling giant movie, but it's about people. And that's one of the great things that science fiction at its best can do. And that's one of the things I've really always admired about this film. Well, unlike you, I do have friends who don't really care for this movie, mm-hmm. but not to name names because I'm about to insult them, but they're kind of dumb and they, th- and they think like Transformers are thinkers. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're the kind of, there's, there's always, you know, every, every type of movie watcher. And, and I even have some, some friends who don't even really watch movies. Mm-hmm. Like, like, like they've seen maybe, maybe a hundred in their whole life. Like, yeah. You know, you or I. We're in the thousands, if not like tens of thousands at this point. Yeah. Um, the, uh, like I, I have a friend who like thought it was absolutely stupid, absolutely stupid. It, but their favorite movie is like, like I said, like something like Transformers, or mm-hmm. I don't know exactly, but but that's that's the kind of stuff that they always like post about, like being amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's like oh. look. The fact of the matter is, it's like they're. 
I will admit that there are things about there are certain things about Transformers that yeah I could almost use that word with, but most of it I couldn't. Um, yeah, it's 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 one of those things where it's like I. I don't know. I mean, it, you know, Dark City was not helped by the fact that it came out in the middle of Titanic Mania when Titanic basically controlled the box office. That didn't help. You know, it didn't help the fact that it came out in February, which at time at the time was considered barren territory territory for quality cinema. That didn't help. Uh yeah, I mean, there there are other reasons why it didn't necessarily do well. I mean, it made like well, it didn't even make it made like half its budget. I mean, that's that's nowadays I would think it would make a little bit more. I think it would probably have the type of success of uh maybe Blade Runner 2049 or Arrival or something like that, where it's like it's a decent, you know, it made a decent amount of money, but it didn't necessarily make, you know, it didn't really break the bank, but it was, you know, it was a movie that people went to go see. And, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's just, there's so much to talk about. There's so much that can be talked about. I mean, I haven't even talked about the score by Trevor Jones, which I've always loved as a music, as a soundtrack. That's in my notes. I, yeah, I, I that's love it. That's in my notes. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. And they even, didn't they reuse it? Didn't they reuse it for a trailer a few years ago? Oh, yeah, later? I've, I I've, 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 I've heard it in trailers before. I can't remember which ones, but yeah, I mean... It's it's one of those things. It's it's so it's so atmospheric. It's so much. It's there's not a lot of big thematic material in it, and a lot of it is is it's just little motifs and little action cues and stuff like that. To where yeah, it can be it can be used over and over for like trailers and stuff like that because that's all about creating creating an atmosphere. And Trevor Jones just did a tremendous job with the film. I mean, it's it's it's. I'm not going to say it's one of the great scores of all time, but it was definitely one of the best scores of that year. Uh, and oh, it's, it's because yeah. of how well it serves the film. And it serves the film amazingly. And there's emotional content there. There's uh, action beats there that just really... Uh, that that they they all come through. They all shine through. And that's one of the things that I really like about it. I, I I can't agree more. It's it's this this is one of those movies that that I hate. The, the one part I hate about about uh, theatrical releases mm -hmm. is that it's it so much relies on those first seventy two hours of the film's release. Yeah, and how much finances like the finances mean more. And I understand the movie business is a business. Yeah, and it, and every business is there to make money, but. Like it, it just it, they rely so much on that those first seventy two hours that if a film like uh, if a film doesn't doesn't make the kind of money they're hoping it does they, yeah. sometimes movies get pulled, pulled after the first weekend mm -hmm. like like uh, and mind you I'm a big fan of like Saturday Night Live so I enjoy the guilty pleasures of like uh, like a movie like It's Pat yeah. It's Pat was pulled from majority of the theaters like the first weekend the same with Meteor Man Meteor Man is not that bad of a movie. It's it's not that great of a movie, <laughs> but like it's it's not that bad of a movie. But it was pulled like before, like I think on Saturday of the first yeah. weekend. Like they pulled it like after like thirty hours or something like that. What whatever the case may be, but mm -hmm. like, like they rely so much on the return of their investment. Yeah, like in those first seventy two hours, it's like, and I understand that 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 it is it is like I said, business and it's about money. But sometimes movies are more than just money. It, yep. Sometimes it is art. Sometimes it, it's a passion uh, of of the, the the creators, the artists, the the ones all involved. And, and it and it, it, I think this is a movie that I shines through because to me this is a very dystopian nightmare masterpiece for me. It, yeah, it really is. It with because uh, we didn't even mention that the strangers are the aliens are inside of the dead experiments. Yes, they're, they're yes. Just, you know, <laughs> that is like that's kind of frightening, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's amazing all at once, but it, it's just so, so it's such a beautiful film that like it, a lot of people rely on that that money. How much did it make? Does it matter? Yeah, you know, like <laughs> it's it's phenomenal. Give it a watch. Mm -hmm. And and 
No, and, and you bring up, yeah, we didn't talk about the fact that the strangers are basically inhabiting the corpses of humanity. And it's like, that's another thing that makes the strangers interesting because you see that their ultimate purpose is to assimilate into humanity. And so you add yeah. Invasion of the Body Snatchers to that. And it's just oh, yeah. all these little things that these little nuances that Preuss and Dobbs and Goyer uh, bring to the table that is just really fascinating. And it just adds so much more. And it's like, it's like, no, you're not necessarily going to get everything on the first try of watching this movie, but you can get everything on the first try of this movie if you really uh, engage with it fully. And that's one of the that's one of the things that I did certainly when I watched it for the first time. And uh, it it's <clears throat> is a movie that I I definitely think is one of the great films of my lifetime and one of the great films of all time. It's a movie that means a great deal to me uh, as somebody who's as a composer who's in, been inspired by film music, as somebody who's been inspired by film images and by somebody who enjoys enjoys films by filmmakers with a very particular voice. And, uh, and I mean, the thing is, this isn't the first Proyas film to deal with uh, the inner workings of a world that he's created. He did the same thing. He, he did it to a certain extent with iRobot. He did it with Knowing. And uh, that's one of the... And, it's one of those things that I really, I'm really interested about him with his, his films. And yeah, no, not all of his films are great. God, Gods of Egypt was terrible, um, <laughs> but uh, it's it's he's he's always an interesting filmmaker, and he's always a filmmaker. He's a filmmaker that I'm always going to uh, give a chance because of the fact that he, you can tell just in the. Uh, the work they did at his, that he's done at his best that he's got more going on than just oh I want to make a movie and I want to tell a story and you know there he wants to tell very particular types of stories and that's one of the things I really love about him. Would you say that like I know iRobot's probably his most profitable films, but would you say he he left his his uh talents in the 90s as I recently came across a review for him? No, because of the fact that I, I really like knowing. Uh, I I actually really like knowing the Nicolas Cage movie he did. Um, and he did a uh, musical comedy between Dark City and iRobot called Garage Days that's pretty entertaining as well. I really um, like that film. I, I think he I I think I don't know that he left his talent there. I just think the opportunities have not been there for him to do the type of stories that he was able to do with the Chrome Dark City. Um okay. but yeah, I mean I I I think if he had been given more freedom on iRobot and it wasn't a big studio production. I, I think it will have turned out a lot differently. And I mean I, I still really enjoy iRobot. I think it's a very good film. It's 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 a nice it's an interesting I it's interesting adaptation of the ideas of Asimov, even though it's obviously not a direct uh adaptation of the book. Um I think there I think the ideas are there for Asimov's uh universe. And I, it would have been nice to have seen him get a little bit more freedom, but I mean, unfortunately, when you're dealing with, I don't, and I don't think, and I don't necessarily blame Will Smith. I, I think Will Smith probably is, I think Will Smith, to a certain extent, is an actor who, if you give him the opportunity to work with a challenging filmmaker who's going to challenge the ideas, I think he's going to, I think he's going to allow that. I just think it's harder to do when you have a $100 million budget. I mean, I think that's if the movie cost like half that and it had been made by like Lionsgate at the time, I think it would have been a different story. I think it would have been a more interesting movie. Um, although, I mean, he he made Gods of Egypt for Summit, which was 
But, I mean, that just wasn't a great idea for a movie in general and the execution. There's a lot of really nice visuals in Gods of Egypt, but it's just, it's not the type of thing that I think he, I I kind of feel like he was a director for hire on that one, and that's unfortunate. But, right. yeah. I I think I think he's he's still got the potential to make a real make really good films. He just needs the opportunity to. So in the artistic freedom for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he yeah he he's definitely somebody who I think works better outside of the uh, big studio system. Um, I mean, at the time new at the time that Dark City was made, New Line was. It was a part of Warner Brothers, but was still an independent studio for the most part. It wasn't until after they did Lord of the Rings that they really became a major player, um, which was you know a couple of years down the road after Dark City. But um, that's when that's when that studio I feel like really really changed and became more of a mini major than an independent force. So. Well, my my uh, I feel like we're coming to an end here, and yeah. so I'm going to say my my closing my for anybody who well I guess we were kind of spoiler heavy here a little bit, but um, anybody who hasn't seen the movie who has gotten to this point, uh, it, it would do you a great service to before you press play, turn your phone off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, shut up, shut up, and pay attention because mm-hmm. you're you're gonna you're gonna wind up. You know, going down this this rabbit hole of wonderful, uh, wonderful film noir tribute. You yeah. know, it's, it's fantastic. It's it's just a really really good film, and I I need to get my hands on the director stuff now. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I I need to I need to like re-listen to the uh, commentaries from Proyas and his collaborators as well as Roger Ebert because it's been a while since I've listened to those. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if if you haven't seen Dark City and you're listening to that to to this, thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I hope we definitely piqued your interest in the movie. It's definitely well worth it. And I, it's it's something that even if you read spoilers about, it, I don't think it will necessarily take away from the experience because the fact of the matter is the movie is so rich. The movie is has so much imagination and so much. Uh, so many ideas uh, as a part of it that it's hard to really ruin it because of even, even, you know, I mean, you, you've only seen the theatrical version with the narration that basically tells you the story right off the top. And it's still a great movie. Uh, That was the same way with me. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting to watch the director's cut without the narration, but I can. It's easy for me to do that because of the fact that I've seen the movie so much. I know the story, so it's like I'm not going into it fresh. And uh, yeah, I mean, if 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 you haven't seen it, I definitely recommend it. It's 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 one of the great movies of the '90s. I feel like, and it's one of the great movies of my lifetime. It's a movie that means a great deal to me. I, it's one of the things that I love about science fiction. I love the ideas. I love the imagination. It's one of the movies that sort of is why science fiction is one my is my favorite genre of all time. And uh, Dark City is definitely one of the reasons for that. Uh, thank you very much, Marv, for uh, joining me on uh, this podcast. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely... I know we're, we're definitely... Uh, we've already talked about doing podcast another podcast uh for the sonic cinema podcast as well as one that you're you're working on i'm definitely looking forward to those opportunities as well excellent well thank you for having me man i, I really enjoy sitting and talking movies with you. i wish i could do it in person sometime yeah i'd like to thank marv dickey for joining me today it was a lot of fun talking to him Uh, We do have another one planned uh, for the podcast later in the year. We're going to look at Richard Linklater's Days and Confused. And also we're going to work on a... uh, We're also going to work on an episode for a uh, podcast that Marv is going to do. And uh, the movie we're going to discuss, uh, hopefully, is Steven Soberg's Kafka. So I will uh, have more information on that and share that link uh, when it becomes available 
Uh, if you haven't already, uh, any contribution to the Sonic Cinema Patreon uh, would be most appreciative. It is at patreon.com backslash Sonic Cinema, all one word. I've done a lot of uh, mini blogs on the uh, Academy Award nominees this past month. I've already got another uh, another reward on the way. It's been put up. It is about my uh, music. Coming up, I've got a, another... I've got a couple of episodes where I look at films. Um, in addition to this one, I have uh, one that I'm doing with a uh, friend of mine on Passion of the Christ, as well as one with Heather L., where we discuss the uh, new Planet of the Apes trilogy, and we'll probably talk about the franchise in general. So thank you very much for joining me. This is Brian Scuttle at the Sonicsima podcast saying thank you very much, and I hope you have a good day. Thank you.